and, and she's going to do wonderful things because that's like the uh, Emmys and the uh, Oscars of the world, but in the fashion business and more. And to introduce Diane von Furstenberg for me, briefly, is impossible. She is uh, the first founder and president of Diane von Furstenberg, uh, the corporate umbe umbrella for all diverse business ventures. And as I see up there, I have turning a passion of life into a passion for business, and uh, she has done extraordinary. She, we call her the fairy tale princess. She's a famous designer, writer, socialite, entrepreneur. She has made her mark on culture, which is very important in a world that seems almost a little uncivilized today. She's a unique blend of European style, American ingenuity. She's been a trendsetter in all areas of fashion, uh, including home furnishings. She's written books. She was born in Belgium and educated in the capitals of Europe. Uh, she met her husband, uh, the Prince von Egon von Furstenberg, at the University in Geneva. And they moved to New York, and they have two wonderful children. And, well, I'm not, I'm only touching the surface. You have to explain everything. I leave that to you. And uh, as uh, Diane requested, I'm not, I, I hate to go into all this, but I love her. And I think she is an example of what I think a woman should be like. Feminine, strong, talented, and that's, I could go on and on, as I said. So I would love to have her come up and get me off the stage. Well, no, I don't need it. I just, okay. No, but I need my hand. Okay, all right. It's a little, sorry. Um, no. It's a horror? Well, you request. I don't know what to say. I can't, all right, never mind. Okay, I'll stick it in my hand. Okay. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, I am here, I come here every year. Uh, that's right. And I know there's, at some point in November, I show up here. And every year I speak to a big group here. I, what I'm going to do, because uh, you're all students and you're all studying fashion and you are all, you have big goals for your life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about my experience. And uh, so maybe from my experience, you will learn something or not learn something in any case. So what I will do is I will tell you the story. And in order to have some kind of itinerary, I'm going to follow pictures. And we start, okay, with uh, me as a little girl. I was born in Belgium. And um, then I had curly hair. What else is new? Um, and this is the picture of my wedding, but this is uh, an important picture for many reasons. First of all, because uh, it was the day of my wedding when I married Egon von Fürstenberg, my sweetheart that I met in college. And uh, I married him in, uh, in uh, Paris. And uh, by, because he was a prince, by marrying him, I became a princess. And uh, so the reason that I always show these pictures at first is because in fairy tales, usually the end of the fairy tale is the girl marries the, frin the prince. Well, in my fairy tales, it's only the beginning. That's what I want to say. And there's another, uh, another thing important in this photograph is there is a man in the back in, the, in between us. He has a white shirt. And his name was Angelo Ferretti. And uh, he, w he was very important in my life because he was a, an Italian manufacturer. He, I had met him uh, prior, a few years before my wedding. And he had... Uh, three plants. He had one printing plant in Como where he printed 
uh, scarves. He also had a knitting factory where he made jersey fabric. And he had another factory where he actually made uh, intimate apparel, um, nightgowns, very fine uh, lingerie. And uh, I, um, so for, uh, before I got married, I was uh, working with him in his factory. I don't think I was really working, I was doing an internship, uh, and I really, at the time, I was thinking that I wasn't doing anything. But actually, now, looking back, I know that everything that I, I, I know now, I, I still remember from them. I learned everything about printing, everything about color, about uh, how you print, everything about jersey, how you knit fabrics, how you cut, and so I learned everything from that, that, that time, and that was a very, very instrumental year. Um, I got married and li moved to America where my uh, fiancé was already living. And by the time I got married, I was already pregnant. And um, that's okay, you can laugh. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason why I make a point of that is that I very much wanted to be an independent woman. That was my dream. As a, when I was a student like you, all I wanted really was uh, uh, to be an independent woman. And here I am, wanting to be an independent and finding myself pregnant and getting married very young. And I was really, I had very mixed feelings about that. So I went to my friend in, 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 in the factory, uh, Angelo, and I said, would you please allow me to make a few samples from your, um, from your factory? And if I can make a sample, uh, 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 samples, maybe when I go to America, since I'm going to move there and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get married, I could sell, I could try to see if I can sell those samples. So he said, sure, and I made a few samples. And uh, I got married and I moved to New York. And uh, in New York, I uh, was introduced to my husband to Diana Vreeland. Now, I don't know if you know who Diana Vreeland is, but uh, she was at the time the uh, editor-in-chief of um, Vogue magazine. And she was what they call a dragon lady. She was very, very, very powerful, very intimidating, but quite a, an extraordinary woman. So I managed to have an appointment and I went to see her and I had a big suitcase and a big stomach because I was pregnant. And uh, I went to see her and uh, I was very intimidated. Everybody looked, everybody was so stylish and dressed all in black and there was a candle lighting and clothes everywhere and, and um, jewelry. And, um, and um, so I was, um, so I went to see her and she, I remember she walked into the room and I had hanged all my clothes on, on some uh, rack there and she walked into the room and she was, her, eye, her nails were very, very red and her lips was very, very red and her hair was black and she was smoking a cigarette with a long, um, how do you say that? Cigarette holder. And she walked in and she looked at me and the first thing she did is she pulled my chin up and she said, chin up, up, up. And I thought, oh my God, this is not starting well. And, uh, but actually it was. She really liked the clothes and she said, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And 20 minutes later, I found myself outside her office on the floor, putting the clothes back into the, um, the suitcase. So she said, uh, I looked at her assistant and her assistant said, you know, I think she's going to do something about this because she really liked it. And I said, well, what should I do now? And she said, well, I think you should show the, you should show. Uh, so she said, you know, soon is market week. I'm looking for, soon is market week. And there is this hotel on 55th Street. At the time, it was called the Gotham Hotel. And that's where America, um, 
Los Angeles firms, Los Angeles line, show their line. So what you should do is try to get a, a suite or a room in this hotel, and you could show there. And I said, all right. And I said, but how will people know about it? And they, she said, well, you should list yourself on something called the fashion calendar. And so I looked at her and I said, can I use your phone? And up from her phone, I made, I called the fashion calendar, I called the hotel, I booked myself a, 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 a room, and um, the next thing is I went to a friend of mine, had my picture taken on a white cube, and, uh, and then I looked at it and the cube was so white that I felt I had to put something in it, so I just wrote, feel like a woman, wear a dress, and that was the beginning of my business. And soon, uh, sure enough, Diana Vreeland uh, followed through because she did photograph my clothes in Marisa Berenson here and Pat Cleveland. And if you look at the price, you know that that's a very, very long time ago. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, in the next last, in two years, I had two children. So in two years, I had two children. And in this photograph, actually, my husband, myself, my daughter, and my son, all of us are together 50 years old. So, uh, I, for the first two years, I worked out of my dining room, and I had babies, and I went back and forth to the factory, and back and forth, doing invoices, and selling to a few shops, and shipping to the few shops, going back to the factory, trying to make new samples, begging my friend to, to produce, because the quantities were very little. My orders were like 12 pieces, and 20 pieces, and 40 pieces, and, uh, and he kept on saying, but I have a big factory. I can't do these quantities, and I said, please, please, stay, stand by me, because I know it will work. But after two years, I realized that I had a product, because I could see that wherever I had sold in, the, 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 the dresses would sell, but I didn't know how to go about it, and so I thought, well, you know, I should probably become a division of a large company. So, um, I, I found, I well, I couldn't go in the internet, there was no internet, but I looked around and, and identified three, three big 7th Avenue firms. And uh, I made, I called them and I made appointment with uh, management. And I tried to, you know, I brought the clothes and I tried to sell myself because the idea was if I could become a division of their company. Well, nobody was interested. The last man I saw wasn't interested, but he was very nice. And he said to me, you know, I don't think you need me. I don't think you need any of us. All you need to do is get a showroom and get a salesman. And I looked at him and I said, well, I don't know any salesman. Do you know anybody? I mean, you have to understand, I was just new in this country, two years, uh, coming from Europe, 22, 24 years old. So I, I didn't really know how to go about it, and I was terrified. So he said, come back next week. So I came back next week, and uh, he introduced me to this man who at the time appeared to be very old. He was 39 years old. He was a salesman, and he was unemployed. And uh, he looked at me, and he said, okay, well, maybe I could do that. I said, well, the problem is I really can't pay you very much, so how much do you want? And he said, well, if you give me $300 a week, and 25% of the company, I'll come in with you. So $300 a week, I could do that. I thought, okay. And 25% of zero, it's zero. So I said, sure, and we got in business. So at first, he didn't really understand, um, he didn't really understand the type of clothes that I made because the clothes were very soft, they were made out of jersey, and, uh, and he, he wasn't used to that kind of, of product. So what I did is I made a few shirts for himself, I asked him to wear them. Once he wore them, he understood how comfortable and cozy the fabric was, and then he started to sell. He was actually a very good salesman. He had all the contacts of all the specialty stores and the department stores all around the country, and very soon we had quite, you know, he was selling very much, and it was really 
something. So here we are. I was on the cover of Women's Wear Daily, and famous people at the time were wearing the dresses. On the right up there is uh, Nixon's daughter, Julie Eisenhower, and uh, she was making a speech there, and she was wearing my little wrap top with a skirt. And that particular style did very well. It was a little wrap, wrap top that was um, almost like a dancer you know, like a little dancer top. Uh, and it did very well. So I thought to myself, well, maybe that top should become a dress. And that's the birth of the wrap dress. Now, it's not like I invented, I mean, wrap dresses is the most fundamental, uh, the most traditional form of um, dressing. It's like a kimono, it's like a toga. It, it's, it's a way of dressing that crosses and doesn't have buttons. But what was different about this is that I use jersey. And therefore, it was close to the body, it molded the body, it was very, um, it sculpted the body, and it became very, very flattering to women. And within no time at all, we became very, very, very successful. So successful that it landed me on the cover of Wall Street Journal. And here I have a very funny story. I, I was, uh, by, by, by now I am separated from my husband and I therefore live alone in my apartment with my two small children. So because I have small children and, and my partner makes me travel all the time, left and right, everywhere, uh, to go to promote uh, the clothes in all these different cities in, 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 um, in the country, I always try to take very early flights in the morning so that I can have dinner with my children the night before. So this is now January 24th, is that what it said? No, 28th? I don't know, I can't read it. Um, uh, 1974, and uh, I am in an early plane to Pittsburgh. And I remember I was the only woman on the plane, and it was like 7.30 in the morning, and I was alone in the plane, uh, the only woman in the plane, and that day I was on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, so I had bought the Wall Street Journal at the airport, together with a whole bunch of other newspapers and magazines, and I sat down in the plane, and, and I had the whole, all, the, all the magazine, and on top of it I had the Wall Street Journal. And there was a man next to me, and he, you know, I was kind of cute and very young. And there was a, a, a man next to me, and he looks at me, and he looks at me, and he looks at me, and he doesn't know how he's going to talk to me. And finally, he looks at me, and he says, why does a pretty girl like you read the Wall Street Journal? <laughs> so I looked at him, and I thought, jerk. <laughs> but. Actually, and I could, of course, have said, but I'm, you know, this is me there on the cover, but I didn't say anything. And of all the uh, satisfactions that I have had in my life, the satisfaction that I said nothing to him was probably why, up there. Of course, ever since I make a speech, I always tell the story, so <laughs> here you go. But anyway, so I became very successful very, very quickly, so quickly that a lot of co other companies came to me and made me contracts to, to have my name for all kinds of different products. I wear jewelry, coats, intimate apparel, bags, scarves, everything. And before I knew, I had actually become a brand. And uh, this is the same year, no, not the same year, two years later, I was on the cover of Newsweek. And uh, Newsweek at the time was even much, much more powerful and important than it is now because we didn't have CNN, we didn't have all of that. And so the, those weekly uh, news magazines were really the Bible. Time and Newsweek was really the Bible. And here I am at the age of 29 years old on the cover of Newsweek. So it was quite something. But like everything that is very, very good, there's always a side that's not so good. And when you get so much exposure so quickly, uh, every single store in America wanted the clothes. They wanted the wrap dress, they wanted the wrap dress, they wanted the wrap dress. My salesman wanted to sell more and more, more and more, more and more. 
My manufacturer wanted to make more and more, more and more. I was traveling to store to store. I was beginning to worry a little bit because I was seeing that maybe we were making too much of the same thing. But the salesman didn't want to hear it, the manufacturer didn't want to hear it, and there I was. So what had to happen, happened. And my product got saturated. And that's a very good photo for saturation. <laughs> And um, so all of a sudden, from one day to the other, after having been hugely successful and everything I did turned into gold and I was so young and I was living this incredible American dream, all of a sudden, from one day to the other, you know, I had $4 million worth of inventory on my, in my warehouse and, and, and stores were full of it and, and the manufacturer kept on pumping and uh, it was just the worst. So it was really bad and it was really, and at the time my partner who had become so successful so quickly and um, well with the success he had one drink and another drink, a little too many drinks and uh, so I found myself with a partner who had a drinking, pro who had a drinking problem and four million dollars of inventory. So first of all I parted with the partner who did very well. He came in with two hundred and fifty dollars and left a few years later with a million dollar and uh, so I find myself um, without him. And then what happened? The same very, those very same co uh, companies that did not want to have anything to do with me when I went to see them a few years before, all of a sudden I had become a big name in fashion. So even though I was having a big difficulty, for them to have four million dollars worth of inventory was really nothing. So one company called Puritan Fashion, who was at the time, was also, had just launched something called Calvin Klein Jeans. Uh, they he made a deal with me, took my inventory, we did a, um, a license deal, and from that moment on, they were dealing with all of the operation, and my only responsibility was to help them creatively. So that was good. That's, uh, that was solved. But meanwhile, I had gone around the country and me me meet a lot of women and, and been very involved in the fitting rooms and all of that. And I really had liked what I had, was working on. So I really thought that I really wanted to go into the beauty business. So the first thing I did was write a book about beauty. Of course, when you're 28, you're beautiful anyway. But while I was r r writing the book on beauty, I learned about everything. I learned about cosmetics, I learned about all these things that I needed. And I uh, launched a, a perfume, which I named Tatiana after my daughter. And, and a I created a line of cosmetics. And once again, I was on the road, and this time doing cosmetics. Very quickly, within five years, we grew to become a very, very important line. Everybody looked at our colors. I was very much on the edge, and uh, it, was, it was so much fun. I had so much fun on those years. It was really, really fun. And my job was to work on the creative, on the marketing, on the PR, and then go around. And then I had a man in a suit, a very proper man in a suit, who was president. And, um, and he was handling the finance. So here I am, one day I am in Paris, and I get a call from this man, and he's the he was the president of the company, and he says, well, you have to come back because the bankers really want to meet you. And I said, oh yes, why? And he said, well, because they want your personal guaranteed, because you know we have bor borrowed a lot of money. And I said, oh. So I went back, I came back to New York, and uh, I realized that actually we had borrowed $10 million, and now they wanted my personal guarantee. And yes, the company was growing, but more the more it was growing, the more we needed money. And... Um, so they, and I was very afraid of giving my personal guarantee because I had managed to buy a beautiful house in the country, 
which I still have for my children, and an apartment in New York, and I was very afraid of losing that. So, but meanwhile, again, once again, I, I, I had been approached by a lot of um, 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 cosmetic companies who wanted to buy me. And at the time, I was very arrogant. I said, no, I don't want to. But now I was less arrogant. And finally, I did sell my company. And uh, so I sold my company in uh, 1983. And that led me, um, I was number seven woman entrepreneur, whatever. And um, and at the time, I really did not have, that means that, yes, I was OK financially, but I had really given up the control of my name. Because the fashion was a license, and now the beauty was a fashion uh, uh, license. So I opened, uh, it was now 1983, that's what I said. And it was the time of Dynasty, and uh, what was the other show? Dallas, and you know, it was kind of very over the top. So I thought I would, uh, I got a, a small shop in the Sherry Netherlands, and I did a so to speak, a couture line, and, uh, and the, everything else was really a license. I had a luggage license. I had a jeans license. Don't ask me how I went there. <laughs> and, um, but I really didn't control everything. Meanwhile, my children are teenagers. And um, well, I guess it's not so long ago that you were teenagers. So you know that when you are teenagers, you don't, you know, as a parent, you always love your children, but you don't like them. And they don't like you either. So my children uh, wanted to go to boarding school. They went to boarding school, and I decided to go to Paris. And uh, because, and so for, I stayed in Paris, and uh, in Paris I did something completely different. I had a um, um, publishing house. And in order to be, and, and in, in New York I had my licenses, and in order to stay a little bit in touch with them, I did some other kind of books, and, uh, but I really didn't have very much to do or very much control. After five years, I decided to come back to New York. And this isn't really the day I came back, but it's a good photo. And uh, I, I came back to New York and because I missed it. I missed America. I missed my children. I missed the life that I had had there. And uh, by then, my children have become very good-looking, wonderful people. My daughter, Tatiana, and my son, Alexander, they're both uh, at Brown University. And I'm very proud of them. And, but I always thought I had three children, a daughter, a son, and a brand. My daughter came out great. My son came out great. But at the time, my brand was really banned. It had completely deteriorated. Everybody, every company did something else with it. The distribution kept on going down, down. The product had nothing to do with the original product. And it was really, really quite depressing. It was very depressing, and I tried, you know, to go back and talk to the people and talk to the presidents of the different companies, but they didn't really want to hear from me, and they would say, yes, 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 and then, you know, the minute I leave the room, they change everything around. So this was really the time that was probably the hardest time of my career, and I ate a lot of humble pie. And... Um, but I didn't know how to go about it. Nobody, because, you know, because the product had deteriorated, the buyers, the new buyers, really didn't think very much of my name, and the brand had become really, really dusty. But somehow I thought that the women, the customer that I had touched, that I had set a real dialogue with, they would remember me. So <clears throat> I tried to see how I could reach them directly. And that's when somebody mentioned me the name of a company called QVC. And uh, QVC is, uh, do you know what it is? It's home shopping, shopping on television. So one day uh, in 1992, I went to um, QVC. And it was, it was a stage like that. There was a, um, a studio. And, uh, and there in the middle of the studio, the day I get, got in, Susan Lucci, Susan Lucci from Soap Opera, 
She was there selling shampoo. And within half an hour, she had sold $600,000 of shampoo. I thought to myself, this sounds great, you know? And so I thought that they would, I could do cosmetics with them. But they really wanted fashion, which was a little bit of a problem because I thought fashion, I mean, how can you sell fashion on television? And, and to tell you, and the whole thing was a little tacky anyway. But I didn't have a choice. And so I said, let me think about it. And, uh, and I thought of a concept called silk assets. And what it would be, it would be scarves and shirts and um, little tops in solid and prints that would match the colors and, and so on. And um, I went to Hong Kong and I found a manufacturer who was a, 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 a very small manufacturer when I was big. But now I was very small and, the manuf and he was very big. And I said to him, would you, would you consider do this for me and, you know, manufacture this for me? And he said yes. And I made a sample line and then I came back to, um, I came back to, to Pennsylvania and I showed the, cl the clothes. They liked it very much. I went on air and the first two hours I sold a million three hundred thousand dollars worth of silk assets. So all of a sudden, I was from a has-been, I became a pioneer again. And even though this wasn't really what I was hoping to do, this w gave me so much confidence and so much, it made me feel really good. And so I, but I really wanted to go back to, to the clothes that I knew how to design and the clothes that identify with what, what I do. And, um, oh, it's a long story. I went to a, I went to a big store I, at the time. Federated was um, uh, uh, merging all these different stores, and I went to see the chairman and I said, "Why don't I become?" Because you have to understand, twice I sold my company because of inventory, and uh, so I really didn't want to go back in business and have inventory. So I tried to find shortcuts, and so I went to the president of the store and I said, "Why don't I?" become your exclusive private label designer and therefore I will design for you, I will do everything, but then you will make it and you will buy it and you will own the inventory. So anyway, to make a long story short, he said yes and yes and so on and uh, we started to work, I started to design and it was a big investment on their side so I felt like I should have a big investment too. So one thing I did is I got a, a townhouse, a carriage house downtown in the mid pack, which became my studio. And I said I would have this, this, I will have a design studio, I will design, and I will have the showroom, and then your buyers can come and look at it. And the other thing I would do, I said, is I would write a book. And the reason I would write a book is I would tell the story, and that would make a line between the past and the future. When the book would come out, that's when we will launch the collection, and therefore it will, you know, be a tool and blah, 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 blah. Oh, so everything was fine. I got the building, I started to design, and I started to write the book. Except that one Friday afternoon, as I was going to the country, I got a phone call on my car, and somebody called me and said, guess what? The deal is off. They don't want to do it. So that was a big come down. I was very sad and very depressed. I went home for the weekend. And by the time the weekend had finished, I came back to New York on Monday. I called my friend um, Rosemary Bravo, who was president of Saks. And she had come to me a year before, and she had told me, you know, Diane, we need your dresses. Everyone, every other designer is making your old dresses. So she had said that to me, and I remember that. So I called her, and I said, would you like me to do the original dresses and we will launch it exclusive at Saks? And she said, yes. So I went back to the factory and this time instead of being in Italy, I went to China and I worked with the factory with the silk. I decided to do this instead of cotton jersey, they would be silk jersey. And I stayed there days and days in the factory, eating noodles, no longer, Spanish, no longer spaghetti with the Italians, but noodles with the Chinese. And, um, 
and uh, developing this new fabric. And uh, we went back and forth and back and forth, and I got the right fabric, and I went back to the original dress, the wrap dress, and this is the ad that I created for launching it. And it's very funny because I had these two pictures, and I said, he stared at me all night, and then he said, something about you reminds me of your mother. And everybody in my office said, you're mad. Who wants to look like their mother? But I just thought it was funny. I only thought it was funny, but I didn't really think that's actually what happened. And it was a whole new generation of women that actually went for it and really liked it. So it was the sax, but it was also the scoop. So all of a sudden, um, and, and because I had also seen all the young girls buying the old dresses in vintage shops, and that's what it started. So that leads me to the new company, which was a few years ago, not so many. Five years ago, I hired a creative director from St. Martin, and we, he refreshed the wrap dress a little bit and did things that I would never thought of doing like putting my face on t-shirts, and that went into taxis. And today we are a global brand that sells in 42 different countries. Um, and we are um, in, all, we have a wonderful, wonderful distribution the very best of the distribution, but in those distribution, we are not the most expensive. So it's a very, very nice niche because we are in the very best stores in the world, but we are at a very, very good price. A few years ago, I started, I opened my first shop. It was in my near my studio in uh, West 12th Street, and everyone thought I was crazy. But uh, now it's a very, famous and, and hip neighborhood. I then opened my second store in Miami, one in Los Angeles, one in London and Antwerp. We opened in Paris. To, we have two stores in Paris. This is Madonna who came the day of the opening and one in Saint-Tropez. Last year we opened Hong Kong and this year we opened Tokyo. Uh, we are also involved, I'm also involved now in designing um, other products like the bracelet I am wearing, which is fine jewelry that I designed for H. Stern. Um, I began to, to design accessories, handbags, beachwear, scarves, luggage. Luggage actually is the only license that I have kept the entire time. And then I do some other design like uh, rugs. I started again in beauty, which is sold in my stores only. And every now and then I get involved with designing, uh, um, just design things like uh, I did a tennis dress for Reebok, for Serena Williams, which went to Wimbledon. Uh, this year we had fun with the T-Mobile. And this uh, Christmas we did a Barbie. I don't really like dolls, but anyway, they convinced me to do it. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, we have a website, dvf.com, which is uh, also our shop. And today, people talk a lot about celebrities, so I thought I should show you the different celebrities that wear my clothes. And uh, two years ago, I was, um, I received the Lifetime Award from the CFDA. And this year, I was elected the president of the CFDA. And right now, on West 14th Street, under wrap, is what will be next year, my new headquarters. So this is where I am today, and now I'm, uh, I'm ready to answer all your questions.
questions? No questions? Yes. Oh, my main, well, what, as a direct, as a president of CFDA, I represent 282 designers. That's what, that's what the CFDA, it's a, it's a, it's all the designers together have this, this, this non-profit organization. And uh, what I want to do is I want to um, get more and more benefits for them, guidance, that's what I'm supposed to do and do that. I will also work with the city in terms of see how, how we can work together to make New York a more, you know, even more of an important uh, fashion center. And um, so that's basically what I do. I represent my fellow designers. But let me, uh, yes? Uh, <laughs> it's going to be where I sleep. Um, let me tell you, because you are all students, I really want to be able to give you some advice. One advice that I will give you is to pay attention. Uh, you're going to leave here and you're going to start getting jobs. Maybe some of you already have internships. I think Internship is the most wonderful thing you can do because it, it allows you to go into companies, see what, what is being done, learn, and, and then they can notice you. So, but paying attention is probably the most important thing because sometimes you pay attention, you will notice something, you will meet some, somebody, you will see a need, and that will be the door that you have to take. So, you have to pay attention not only to what your professor tells you about her dates, but pay attention to everything, because somewhere out there is the opportunity that you can grab, which will be your opportunity. Yes? We are always uh, we are always interviewing interns, and we have a long line of um, uh, waiting list. But uh, there there's someone in my company that does that, and absolutely, you can intern either in design, in marketing, or in sales. Yes. No, I don't want to sell my company. Now I started again, and this is a family business. It belongs to my children and I. And hope, hopefully my, my, the reason I work so hard right now is because I want to really, you know, make sure that it, it goes exactly the way I want to see it so that hopefully it'll last for a long time. Yes? Well, my, my, my children, both my daughter and my, and my son, are my partners. My son watches all the finance. My, he's really good in finance. My daughter is not really interested in, in design. She's a writer. But we are very, very close, and we speak many, many times a day. And so they know everything, and we have board meetings, and they are on my board. So although they're not involved on a day-to-day basis, they are very involved, yes. So, yes? It's difficult to say because, you know, I started and it, it, it happened so fast. I mean, I, the whole, I got successful so fast that I was kind of running behind the success. So, I mean, I did the best I could with everything. Of course, I mean, the mistake I made is sometimes I hired the wrong people and, but you, you uh, I, I don't think I could have done it any other way. I, I did the best I could and I was very young and very inexperienced. And, uh, but you know, ev life is full of mistakes and the most important thing is just to learn from your mistakes and then if you learn from your mistakes, they, are, they become important and good things. Yes?
No, I traveled a lot. I traveled a lot while I was working, and I only lived away from here when my children were in boarding school. Otherwise, I was living here. So uh, I juggled, you know, I juggled a lot, and uh, I have juggled all my life, and I, I, I think, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know any other life but juggling, but somehow I, you know, it was hard, but, you know, my children went to school, I went to work, we, every night we would talk, you know, they would, they, my children didn't like it when I didn't work, you know, that's when I didn't like it, because they, they like it when I work, maybe because I'm easy or whatever, <laughs> I don't know. Yes? Oh, no, he was already in New York when I hired him. And, uh, you know, it's very, when you hire designers, it's a very difficult thing, you know. It's not like, um, it's not like hiring an accountant. I mean, when you deal with creative people, it's, it, it's, it's, it's more about the chemistry that you have with them, you know, uh, because what, what he did for somebody else was not right for me. You know, every, every brand has a DNA of its own, and my brand certainly has one. So it's, um, it's uh, I, I liked his DNA, I, I mean, I liked, you know, I liked him, and it was funny, he, I interviewed him, he liked it because I had books, he liked me because I had a lot of books around, and I liked him because he noticed that I had books around, you know? I mean, it's, um, having said that, St. Martin is a very good school, and they are obviously schools that are better than others, but uh, I don't, I didn't hire him because he was, Yes? The most uh, um, influential person in my life is my mother. Uh, in my career was probably Diana Vreeland because she really, that was very important. Uh, an event, there are thousands of them every day. Yes? Well, fit is the most important thing for me. And uh, I actually, I'm very, I, I, I play a very big part in the fit, mostly the production fits, you know, um, because, you see, I became a designer by accident. I wanted to, because I had this friend in Italy, and he had this fab this this product, and that, that and I, I became a designer like that. But I am a woman, and the reason that if I have any role in fashion is that I know how to make women look good and feel confident. Maybe it's because I am a woman, and I try things on me, and so, and then of course I became a pro. I mean, I wasn't a pro when I started, but I am a pro now. Um, but fit is the most important. Well, there's many things. The first thing you do is you choose the fabric. And for me, it's very important that the fabrics are very soft, that they feel good, that they move. I particularly love jersey. So my line is probably 80% jersey. I love jersey. It moves with you. It doesn't wrinkle. It's practical. It's beautiful. Uh, so fabric is one thing. Color is huge, and print is, is an extension of colors, and that's something that I do personally very much. I'm, you know, very close to. And then the fit is extremely important because you have a beautiful design, but the way it fits, you know, will make you either comfortable, and then if you're comfortable, you look, you're more confident, and if you're more confident, you look more beautiful, and blah, 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 and like that. So in other words, to answer your question, fit is very important. All right, so happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>